part one in our receivables and accounting for uncollectibles series. And we're going to be talking about internal controls and reporting. So first, let's look at a scenario here. We have Mark Bishop. He is the accountant responsible for customer accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. So let's stop there for a second and recall what a subsidiary ledger is. Remember, the accounts receivable account is really a control account. And underneath that great big control account, we have these little bitty account receivable accounts called subsidiary ledgers. And each one of those little bitty account receivable accounts have, an, have a name or a customer name attached to them. Account receivable John, account receivable Bill, account receivable Patty. And the balances and all those little subsidiary ledgers uh, feed up to that great big control account receivable account. So that's what a subsidiary ledger is. What duty will a good internal control system withhold from Bishop and why? So we'll do this one together. So just kind of think about this for a second. And what should be withheld from Bishop? Well, the accountant should not handle the cash. The accountant that keeps the books should not be handling cash because there's too many things that could happen there. Bishop could easily steal the cash, and then he could hide his theft by writing off a customer's account as uncollectible. And then it disappears. The customer would no longer receive an, in receive an invoice. Therefore, the customer says, okay, well, I, I paid off my bill, and I shouldn't get an invoice anymore. And the company's happy because, well, not necessarily happy, but they don't see that bill on there anymore because it was written off. So now let's take a moment and let you get a chance at looking at some internal controls. Here we have Mail Plus. They perform mailing services on account, so virtually all cash receipts arrive in the mail. Gina Starr, the owner, has just returned from a meeting with new ideas for the business. Among other things, Starr plans to institute stronger internal controls over cash receipts from customers. Assume you are Gina Starr. Consider how you would ensure that all cash receipts are deposited in the bank and all cash receipts are posted as credits to customers' account receivables. So I'm going to give you a second. So push pause on your video player right now. Take a second and think about what's being asked here. What would you do in this scenario? Okay, now we're back. And I hope you took a chance to think about this question here. So the first thing you should have thought about, or one of the things you should have thought about, is someone other than the accountant should open the mail and separate customer checks from the accompanying remittance slips. The remittance slip is typically that little section of the invoice at the bottom that says, tear here and submit this with your payment. Another thing, an employee with no access to the accounting records should deposit the cash in the bank immediately. The remittance slips should go to the accountant, who will use them for posting credits to the customer accounts. A third person, such as the owner or the manager, compares the amount of the bank deposit to the total of the customer credits posted by the accountant. This gives some assurance that the uh, day's cash receipts went into the bank and that the same amount was posted to customer accounts. And one other thing you may have said is the person who handles the cash should not prepare the bank reconciliation. So now let's take a look at receivables and accounting issues. So this should report receivables at the amount the company expects to collect. In other words, the net realizable value. Well, we should know at this point what financial statement receivables appear on, and that is the balance sheet. So to calculate net account receivables, we're going to start with our account receivables, and we're going to subtract from that 
what's called our allowance for uncollectible accounts. You may also see this called allowance for doubtful accounts. And that will give us our net accounts receivable, what we expect to collect. This financial statement should report the expense associated with the failure to collect. So remember, when we have a journal entry, there's always a debit and a credit. So we have the allowance for uncollectible accounts, which would be the credit in that journal entry, but we also would have a debit to an expense account, and that expense account is, is called uncollectible account expense, or you may see it called bad debt expense. And we know now that expenses appear on the income statement. So let's take a look at this journal entry that we're talking about here. So here we are estimating our uncollectible or bad debt expense, and I've given you a timeline here. And let's say, for example, on November the 9th of any given year, we made a sale. We recorded a sale. So remember, you record revenues when they are earned, not necessarily when cash is received. But we have come up with this method, and we'll talk about these in part two of our series here, of estimating our uncollectible accounts. So at December 31st, the end of our fiscal year, we need to estimate our uncollectible accounts for that year, whether it be based on a percent of sales or an aging schedule. So remember the matching principle. The matching principle states that we record expenses in the period they're incurred. Therefore, we're matching the expenses with the revenues those expenses created. So to record this journal entry on December 31st, so therefore it's an adjusting entry, we would first debit what's called our uncollectible accounts expense, and we would credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. The uncollectible account expense is an operating expense on the income statement, and the allowance for uncollectible accounts is our contra asset account. So we've, we've talked about some contra accounts in the past, and this is just a new one called allowance for uncollectible accounts. And it effectively reduces our assets by reducing our accounts receivables to give us net accounts receivables. So it's still in the asset section of the balance sheet, but it does reduce the value of our assets.